Benno Rice is a software architect from Melbourne with very, it says here, he's a very diverse experiment. It's true. Uh, <laughs> he's written everything from proxy servers to web applications for helping conference delegates meet each other. So today he'll be introducing us to behavior driven development. Please make him welcome. <clears throat> Alrighty, so this says, uh, well, it's another talk about this kind of thing. Um, but it's also a talk about, you know, why do we test? Like, what is the end goal of this testing process? And so, you know, we, we have unit tests, we have integration tests, we have functional tests. Um, but we derive these tests from the same thing that we're deriving our application from, which is the requirements of the application. And so you sort of start with a set of requirements and then you create a set of uh, tests and, a set and an application or the other way around, depending on which way you like to do these things. Um, but wouldn't it be good if you could actually just write out a set of requirements and then test them? So that's where we get to this kind of thing. Um, and it's interesting. I, I, I run across a bunch of people who go, behavior what now? And I run across a bunch of people who go, um, a certain Anthony's who shall remain Baxter, who go, what agile, <laughs> um, and so on and so forth. Um, the main reason they sort of it hits the agile button and people start getting weird about it is it came out of a company called ThoughtWorks. Um, you may have heard of them. Um, there was a guy called Dan North who worked there and he wrote a really interesting blog post about it in which he, he defined behavior-driven driv development as um, that, which makes absolute sense. I don't understand why people don't like it. Um, I prefer, I'm not really an X-driven development kind of guy. Um, I, t I try to think about more this kind of thing. Behavior testing allows you to test your application as a whole, so we're talking holistic, we're not talking unit level, we're talking whole of application, in such a way that all stakeholders, and I mean everyone, not the people writing it, but also the people who are defining it, the people who are owning it, and so on and so forth, can define and understand what's being tested. It's that last, and that last bit is very important. If you can get it to the point where you're not, write, you're not the one writing the actual tests, you're writing the tests in concert with the people you're writing them for, suddenly you've got a much bigger avenue open to you to get agreement on what your application's meant to be doing. So, um, break it down further. It allows everybody involved to write tests, not just the coders. Um, I do this at work. Um, I sit down and argue with my boss repeatedly over what things mean. Um, it encourages thinking about the application in a natural and consistent language, and I'll show you how that works in a bit. Um, so, a bit of history. Uh, as I mentioned, Dan North. Dan North worked at ThoughtWorks. ThoughtWorks at the time was a big Java shop, so he used to deal with a lot of that. That would be a JUnit test case with all the boring bits taken out. Um, uh, <laughs> yes, it's still got the word public. No. Um, so. One day he came across a tool that a colleague had written called Agile Docs. And what Agile Docs did is it took uh, th these sort of test names here and turned it into that. So he was taking the tests for a particular component and turning it into the definition of the component. And so Dan looked at that and went, why can't we do that the other way around? And so instead of defining your tests from your requirements and then defining your application from the requirements, you just define your application from the tests because the tests are the requirements. So we, he needed to come up with a language for that and so he turned to a, another colleague who was more on their business analysis side and they used a template that they used for a lot of things and they broke the, an application down into features and features are defined by the following statements. As an actor, um, an actor doesn't have to be a user directly, it doesn't even have to be a person, it could be an API consumer, it could be a Mars rover. Um, so as an actor, in order to gain some benefit, so in order to land on the surface of Mars without crashing, I want a feature, I want a parachute, or or sky crane. I, I want a sky crane. <laughs> I really want a sky crane. Um, so, 
you, you define a feature in those terms and what that's gaining from you is it's saying who's doing it, why they're doing it and what they're hoping to achieve from it. And then a feature is defined by a set of scenarios. Given a precondition, uh, given I am currently however many thousand kilometres above the surface of Mars, when an action, when I cross the certain point where I need to start slowing down a lot, then an expected outcome happens. My parachute, well, my sky crane, yes, my sky crane deploys. <laughs> yes, my sky crane. Um, <laughs> this is a lot funnier than when I was rehearsing it. Um, <laughs> so, um, the next trick is to turn that into an actual language. So, um, given that I have a predilection for helping people meet up on flights, um, that's what a feature block looks like. That comes at the start of a file. You're naming your feature. Um, and there's the three statements that I mentioned. And that's what a scenario looks like. And so you'll notice that we can use the word and here to follow on and make sure the whole thing actually makes some vague sort of English sense. Um, we actually have localization too. You can use different languages. It's kind of cool. But given I'm at the meetup page, when I fill in a bunch of data and click the button, then my flight should appear in the list and my name should appear next to my flight. That's the kind of thing that, like I was saying before, I can understand it, you can understand it, my boss could understand it, even though he doesn't write any code. So we can argue about that, if this is the application I'm building, until we actually have that description right. The trick then is to bind it to something that can actually test it. So there's a, the tool that everyone knows about for this is called Cucumber, which is a Ruby um, tool. Um, it can test Java code because of JRuby. It can theoretically test Python code because of Ruby Python, but if you ever want to use Ruby Python, don't. It embeds a Python interpreter inside a Ruby interpreter, and what could go wrong? Um, so there are a bunch of tools that got developed previously. Um, the two that still exist are called Lettuce and Freshen, obviously. Um, they had a bunch of issues that made them annoying for me to use. Mainly they, the, oh, I'll go into that later. Um, but in the end, I wrote my own and, uh, well, I started writing my own and then Richard Jones got interested in the, and he also wrote it with me. So let's show you a bit of what this looks like. <laughs> so let me just switch applications on this so that I know what I'm doing. Okay. Um, so this is the meetup page. Um, for those of you who do, didn't see it when it was, uh, didn't use it, it's fairly straightforward. You've got the arrival times, the airline, so on and so forth, a list of people and a form down the bottom to add yourself. Um, and here's the code that did it. It's, uh, it's a Django app. It's nothing particularly fascinating. I think I'm going to have to reduce my font size a bit on this one just to be able to fit things on, but we'll see how we go. So models, everything. So I'm going to try and wrap a few tests around this thing. So the first, the way we do this in Behave is we, we don't create a new file, we create a new folder. Um, we hold everything in a features directory and inside that we have a steps directory. The steps are the implementations of the steps that we're, that we're doing. So first things first, let's have some steps. Um, there's a feature as a PyCon attendee in order to so on and so forth. Um, I want to see a list of flights that I can add myself to. So first thing we really care about is the meetup forms there. So when I fetch the meetup page, then I should see the meetup form. So we'll save that as that, at which point we can go over here and run behave and it will happily tell us that it can't find the step definition for that. So this is what the output of behave looks like. You can see we're actually just echoing out the feature text. Um, you can actually copy and paste that bit back into a feature file and it'll run. Um, but what we do is we colorize based on what happened. Um, the cyan one got skipped because the yellow one was missing. And we actually tell you at the bottom how you can implement that. So we can copy this and go back over to our project. We can paste that in, save it, and go back. 
at which point it doesn't work because we're asserting false. But so where the red text obviously means a failure. Now, watchers who are watching would notice that I didn't actually import anything in that. That's because we cheat. We evaluate that. We don't actually import it, mainly so we don't pollute the module namespace and do all sorts of other stuff. But we can do that, and that's fine. Um, so we should now implement this step properly. So we're just using requests because, as we all found out this morning, request is awesome. Um, we have our server URL, which I am running off to the side. Pay no attention to that. And so when I fetch the meetup page, then I'm going to request that and store the content somewhere where I can use it later. So now when I run this, we'll notice that it's gone green, and our next step is, being, is complaining about being unimplemented. So we'll go and implement that. So we're just using beautiful soup. Uh, we're parsing it, we're finding a form element, making sure it's the right one, and asserting everything's there. So now, everything is happy. So the next... So moving along, we can implement more steps. So we want to see that there's a, a table of flights there. Now, if I run that, this is part of the fun part. Notice that we've already got a parsing step because we use the same text, behave, match that to the same uh, step definition and ran it just as the other one did. Um, the only one we're missing is the other, sort of the then step that we've got and we can just implement that one. Uh, what am I up to? Three? Yes. And we're just making sure there's a table there and it's got some rows. And so this comes back to the canonical issue of testing, which is that you're defining how these tests pass. So if you cheat, you're only lying to yourself. So there we go. We're now testing that we can fetch the page, we can see the form, and we can see the flight table. Now, the problem with this is that if I go back over here, not there, there's my Django server running there. If I kill that, Nothing is good. So Behave provides an, a way for you to uh, set up uh, the environment in which you're testing in. So if I just save that and I'll go through it. So there's a lot of stuff here, but the important part is we're pulling in Whiskey Intercept so that we don't have to run a real server. You can start up your own real server in a, in a sub-process if you like, but that can be finicky. You need to make sure it's actually listening to, for requests before you start sending requests to it. Um, we're uh, installing the... Uh, we're, we're doing a bunch of stuff here that's purely to fake out requests. Um, and we're also starting to use this context object here. Uh, Behave passes this context things into all these functions. This is a hook. Hooks allow you to get in and set state up. There's before all, uh, before feature and before scenario. Um, and so they allow you to set up and tear down stuff. Although with tear down, um, the context object will jettison stuff that you've set at a scenario and feature levels. It exits those scenarios and features. Um, so in before all, we're just setting up our WSGI intercept, and we're also providing a, a useful function to set the, to get a browser URL, which we'll use up here instead of this. So we're now using the browser URL function to get that. So now, if I rerun my tests, you know they all work again because we're going through the WSGI bypass rather than running a server. So I am just going to do, ah, come back. So this, I'm just setting up some stuff for later. Um, what I've set up here is, um, because I'm about to start doing some tests where I actually add things, I also need to set up a database environment for Django to work in. So 
I'm just taking a uh, Django test runner host uh, test suite runner hostage and um, using it to set up a test database. And I'm starting to run off the rails. Um, okay, so yes, that's right. Um, so let's create a new. There we go. So now we're going to try adding an entry to a page. This should look familiar. This is exactly the one I had up in the slides. So if I add that as new attendee dot feature, um, if I run that, I'll get the usual sort of um, step missing error. But we can implement some steps for that. So um, again, we're just using the um, the context functions. We're using a mechanized browser that we're setting up inside the environment. I'm just going to try and blow through a few bits because I want to get to some interesting stuff. So you'll see here that we're actually creating and destroying the database as we go through. And so now we're failing on this when I select DJ1320 as my flight. Now this is where I'm going to show you one of the neat tricks we can do. Where am I up to? D2 step def 3. Yes. Okay. Um, so what we've got here, we can parameterize the steps. Um, the step matcher RE just tells it that we're going to use regular expressions as our step matcher. Um, this is not the default, and I'll show you why in a bit. Um, so what we're doing there is, is in the, instead of just using straight text in the, in the decorator, we're using um, a regular expression, which then gets passed through as a parameter into the step. So if I run this, you'll see that the step's passing, and we've bolded out the flight number so that you can see that we've pulled it in as a parameter. So that means that I can go into this, and I could change the flight number in here, and the step would still pass. As you can see, we just bolded out the, the same thing. So the issue with regular expressions arises if I, want to if I wanted this to have a default like that, it would come in as a named argument, and this would fail because it's being passed as a positional argument. I can get around that by doing this, but that's ugly as hell. So Richard, uh, I don't know if you've come across this one, but you should have because it's awesome, came up with this library called Parse, which is the default for step definitions. And it looks like that. If that looks like the format syntax, that's because it is. Um, it runs the format syntax in reverse, which gets you a whole bunch of things. They'll come in as positional or uh, name-based, depending on what you need. And you can also do things like that, if it was an integer, and it will get parsed in as an integer. So now if I run that, it should run exactly the same. So there's that. And I'll just implement the rest of these really quickly. I can run that, and there we go. So two last things quickly. First one is just a couple of features of the Gherkin language itself. One is tables. Oh, dear, that looks awful. Um, sorry, I didn't test this with the resolution turned up that high. Um, OK, I'm just going to. I'm just going to barrel on through. Um, so this here is a table. Um, if the display was wide enough, you would be able to see that it, um, it just uses bars, uh, pipe symbols as columns. Um, and it hands that in as a, as a, it doesn't hand it in as a dict. You can have multiple rows if you want. Each row can be addressable as a dict or as a, as a list. And so we can then use that instead of having, instead of having this, um, when I select, and I select, and I enter, I can just use this. But the problem is I've already implemented when I select, and I select, and I enter, and all that. And I don't really want to um, 
have to do it all over again. So I can do this, which implements set entering the name and the email address. And then I can implement uh, Is that the right one? No. That. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm getting all the information out of the table that's been handed in, and then I'm generating a bunch of new steps that I can then execute. This allows me to reuse steps that I've written even inside the definitions of other steps. So n now that I have that whole lot implemented, I can run that and get all of that. Um, you can see here that the table step passes and we're all good. Um, so I will just... So now I, can, now I can actually test the other check steps as well. And the last one that I wanted to do is a really quick one. So one of the tests that I have is... Yeah, that's right one. Um, is that I try and be careful about what, um, how I handle Twitter IDs that come in. And I've got a bunch of different formats that I accept them in. So I can use a scenario outline. Uh, scenario outlines loop over the elements in this example, substituting things that match this header ID up in the actual step definition. And the best part is that because I've already implemented all the steps, I can just save that and I can all gets tested. So to sum up, come back. Tests can define your application. We already knew this, but your definition of your application can specify your tests. And this is a good thing. And um, thank you. Thanks, Manu. Any questions? Uh, just one fairly quick one. Um, it, in the, the bit where you had uh, the, the Python code, you were defining the implementations. It looked like you were repeatedly, um, with different decorators, of course, defining impl or the same thing again and again. How, how did that actually work? Um, sorry, oh, def impl. Um, yes, OK, so we don't care what you call your function. We just care that it exists. Um, this decorator here, I'll try and find one that isn't going off the side of the screen. OK, so at when uh, will match any when statement. Um, that matches the step text there. Um, and so the way decorators work is this function will get passed in as a parameter to a function that that returns, and we just squirrel that away. So we don't mind that you call it, I mean, I could call this, um, and it would still work the same way. Um, we actually had an amusing bug that I fixed yesterday that was we used a step as the normal uh, step function. And um, one, of the th one of the things you can use instead of at when, you've obviously got given when and then, but you can also do that if you want it to match any kind of step. But of course, if you did at step, def step, then you don't have step anymore. <laughs> um, yes. Thanks. Oh, sorry, so you scratch. It's like an auction. <laughs> um, okay, so I've got a, a question that's sort of a, I'd, I'd like your feedback or, or comment on a criticism that I've had about behavior driven development yep. as a conceptual level that I don't know if it's just my understanding or just, a, it's just, you know, it's different and it's mm -hmm. a, a different thing. Um, I have a real problem with programming languages that try to say, hey, they're human readable, because they never are. Yes. They look like human language, they're kind of like human language, but you know, the idea that your manager is going to be able to write this isn't the case, because your manager is not going to use that phrasing every single time. Yes, that's why it... Well, okay, here, here is where that's actually a good thing. Um, it makes you do it all together. 
So one of the points I tried to make before is it, in, is it encourages co a common natural consistent language around your application. So if you're always writing these things together, you're going to have those arguments about whether this thing is called this or that or the other and thus what it means for that thing to exist um, in a common place. And so it, it makes people like, makes everybody think more about what the application actually is and what it's supposed to be doing. Right. Okay, so to contrast this approach, which is effectively have one language with which you define, and here is one document where it's defined, and then a bunch of support to say, this is how am I going to process this yep. at a functional level. Another approach would be essentially, and I think you uh, alluded to it, when you said this is where one of them originally came from, mm -hmm. effectively Donald Luth's old literate programming thing, where mm -hmm. you write one piece of, one document, mm -hmm. but its output can be compiled as a PDF, or it can be compiled as running code, or it can be compiled as you know, the series mm -hmm. of different artifacts. The, the documentation value of what is here could equally just be, you know, well marked up comments in a normal unit test. Yes, it could be. Okay. Is there a particular virtue to having it in a separate file with a whole framework around it as opposed to just defining them as unit tests and having a mechanism for extracting them as docs? Um, I would say that's a matter of how you and your team uh, work best. If this works for you because your boss, if you stick code in front of them, they break out in hives, or if they stick, or, or even worse, if you stick code in front of them, they try and edit it, then, um, <laughs> then this would be a, a better one for you to use. But if your team is, say, shall we say, uh, less inclined to break stuff, um, then, I mean, to take a random example, um, requests, I think, would work a lot better in the way you describe because a lot of the people who are using it and its intended audience are all fairly up with how it all works. And for them, and for me even, going through that stuff and having the code right there and seeing it like the, what's that tool that Jeremy Ashkenaz wrote? Um, no, no, the other one. Um, <laughs> um, he, 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 yeah, he wrote one where the, the, you have the, the, the comments down one side and the actual code down the other. And so if you actually go to, I think it's the, the coffee script and a lot of the other ones, you actually get this, this dual, dual pane view of everything and it's actually really good. And for things that are targeted at people like you, me and most of the people in this room, that's awesome because you get to see the code, you get to see how it works. My boss and I'm guessing some other people's bosses, when you try and show them code, they go, yeah, whatever. But if I show them this and say, do you agree with this set of statements? Or e even better, if I, if I bring up this one here, do you agree with that this set of statements describes a, a scenario, this scenario of this feature? And he says, yes, especially if I get that in email. When he then comes back next week and says, no, no, it's supposed to work. I'm like, right, shall we change this document now? And then I can go back and make it work again. That's great, Benny. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.